Today, I'm visiting Winterbourne House and Gardens, a grade two listed garden that is now owned by the University of Birmingham. These gardens were designed by Margaret Netterfold in the Edwardian period, and she based her designs on the books by the horticulturist and artist Gertrude Jekyll. At this time of year, the collections in the garden's main glasshouses are thriving. I spoke with the head gardener, Daniel Cartwright, about Jekyll's influence, those important glasshouse collections, and the plants in them that he loves the most. In total, there were three private families that owned Winterbourne in the entirety of its history. So that would be the Nettlefolds, the Wheelocks and the Nicholsons. Uh, and when uh, the head of the final family, John Nicholson, died in 1944, he bequeathed the house and garden to the University of Birmingham and it's been owned by the university ever since. Gertrude Jekyll was really the preeminent arts and crafts garden designer in the Edwardian period. Our Lady of the House, Margaret Nettlefold, designed the garden herself, um, but she was very, very, very much inspired by the work of Gertrude Jekyll, and in particular, uh, Jekyll's 1899 publication, Wooden Garden. So if you look at Gertrude Jekyll's book, you can actually see where Our Lady of the Household, Margaret Nettlefold, has actually taken pieces of Jekyll's design uh, and transferred them directly to the design here at Winterbourne. So you can actually see that the two gardens are very heavily linked with those design motifs. The areas of the garden where you can see Jekyll's influence the most are on the south side of the house, looking down from the terrace, across one of our colour themed herbaceous borders which is a very sort of arts and crafts motif uh, in our case the pink and blue herbaceous border and looking down into the nut alley which we call the nut walk which is planted predominantly with hazelnuts corallus avalana. Here at Winterbourne we, we have a small glasshouse range um, so we have one original glass house from the Edwardian period, which is a lean-to glass house in our walled garden. And then we have um, four more, much more modern glass houses, which you can see directly behind me. Uh, and these were all built from the university period onwards. Um, so the earliest and, and the biggest is the one that you can see directly behind me. This is what we currently call our Gilbert Orchid House. And this was built in the very early 1960s, perhaps the late 1950s. And this is a really unusual glass house because it's actually been built uh, to face north rather than south where you'd expect to find all of the glazing to catch the majority of the sunlight. So on our Gilbert Orchid house on the south side, we have a solid brick wall blocking out all the light. So it's really quite an unusual one. We believe it was built like that deliberately um, because it was built for the British Antarctic Survey who were based at the University of Birmingham at the time uh, and they were going on expeditions to the Antarctic and then sending back specimens of live plant material to be grown here um, for research on by University of Birmingham Department of Botany students. This is our Gilbert Orchid House, really a, a tropical house in all but name. We, we call it an orchid house, but there's lots of different tropical species in here, not just orchids. Most tropical orchid species are epiphytic, uh, and that means they grow on the branches of other trees or shrubs. So they're not parasitic, they don't do any damage to their host plants. They simply anchor themselves on there and then they suck moisture out of the very humid air using aerial roots. Orchids do that very well, um, but there are lots of other epiphytic species that do that as well. Um, a common one might be air plants like Tillandsia or another common species or, or genera would be bromeliads such as uh, these ones that you can see just above you, just there. As you can see, we've got all sorts of different tropical species in here, philodendrons, bananas, ferns, alocasias, but we've also got quite a nice collection of tropical carnivorous plants as well. These we call, botanically we call them Nepenthes. Um, this is quite a, an important collection for us, um, ties up with our 
a hardier carnivorous plant collection which which is installed in the carnivorous plant houses through the summer can be challenging to grow in this environment like most um, carnivorous plant species um, they respond very poorly to uh, mains tap water um, so we water and feed these exclusively with rainwater that we capture from the roof of the glass houses using water butts We've also got quite a substantive uh, alpine collection here as well. And alpines, of course, really come into their own um, from February through to early April. So this is a really good time for our alpine collections. So this is our little alpine house. This was built sometime in the sort of early 2000s. And this obviously looks particularly good at the moment. Um, so alpine plants are what we call snow melt plants. So they spend quite a large proportion of their life in natural habitat under snow. And then in the spring, all of the snow melts and suddenly there's all of this uh, water available for the plants. So they suddenly spring into growth uh, and then they have, they do everything that they need to do in a very short period of time um, be before conditions become adverse again. So in alpine houses you, you tend to find this sort of peak spring period is when they really do their thing and then they become very quiet through the summer months out of season. Probably the most interesting thing we've got on display is our Lewisias. These are really really good value in the alpine house. They'll flower their heads off um, right the way throughout March. Uh, and all throughout April. We've also got Iphians, so these are a member of the onion family or the Allium family as some of you may know it. Again, like the Lewisias, they're really good value because they'll actually, for an alpine or a plant that we display in an alpine house at least, um, they've actually got quite a long flowering season, again, right the way throughout April. We've also got some uh, woodland anemones, anemone blanda, uh, so you'll see lots of these um, in alpine houses at this time of year. We've also got some auriculas, some primula, primula auriculas, sort of very old fashioned plants. So we like to use some plants that we um, like to think that may have been grown here in the Edwardian period or, or beyond. So we're kind of representing that, that heritage as well. This is a completely unheated glass house. So um, we don't heat alpine glass houses even through the sort of very depths of winter. Um, what we do do is ventilate very heavily uh, and we keep the rain off, hence the glass house in the first place. Um, so alpine plants absolutely hate being wet, so they hate being soaked because although I'm describing this smoke snow melt season where there's lots of water available, of course they're often growing in rock. Um, so the water drains away very quickly and very freely and that's partly one of the reasons why we plunge the plants in sand um, to replicate that draining process. The final glass house that we visited was the Arid House, which is full of cacti and succulents from around the world. This is our arid house, so this is where we, we grow the majority of our cacti and succulents. We're really, really lucky in that we are supported by the local Cacti and Succulent Society, the Birmingham Cacti and Succulent Society. And in fact, many of the plants in here, so you'll notice that I sort of said that the house is only about 15 years old, um, but we've got all these huge mature specimens. Um, so you might be thinking, well, blimey, they, they've grown quickly. Um, but actually, most of the specimens in here were donated by members of the local cacti, cacti and succulent society and were already quite mature plants when they were donated. So we've got loads of interesting and unusual things in here. We've got quite a good representation of euphorbias. These are close relatives of the herbaceous euphorbias that you'll all be familiar with and you'll all grow probably outside in mixed herbaceous borders at home. Um, I often point these out to people because that's quite a nice illustration of the diversity that you can have in one singular genera. So we've got very, very hardy herbaceous species that we've been growing in herbaceous borders in the UK. And then we have these huge arid species as well, and they both belong to the same genera. So it's a really nice illustration of that diversity. 
Here we've got our flowering queen of the night and that only flowers, uh, as the name suggests, at night time, but for a very, very, very short period. So that's always really spectacular when that comes out and comes into bud. That's an event that we look forward to. And on my right hand side, we've got a giant prickly pear, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with from sort of our westerns and things like this. My favourite plant in here is actually one of the most common succulents that, that you can buy or, or grow in this country and that's agave. This variegated one that we've got here is a cultivar called Medio Picta Alba and I really like them because they're so statuesque, they're so architectural. A lot of them we move outside in the summer so we yes we grow them in the house here particularly through the winter but we also grow some specimens in pots and then we move them outside into our summer pot displays and things like this. And it adds a really sort of striking wow factor to our sort of traditional potting displays in the summer. I hope that when people visit Winterbourne, they see an inspiring garden, a creative garden, a space in which horticulturalists are using their creativity and using their imagination I hope they see a garden that's continually changing and evolving and that just never stops in time but keeps moving forward. Um, we don't always get it right, of course, but I hope people see that we're always attempting uh, to push that evolution forward and, and to do so in a kind of creative and imaginative way. I hope in turn that that inspires people to take that sort of philosophy and that attitude uh, back into their own gardens at home. The glass houses at Winterbourne are just a small part of this wonderful seven acre garden. If you want to find out more, head over to www.winterbourne.org.uk and plan your visit now.